Hi, welcome to 16-Bit Bench, Matt here. Uh, today we're going to be taking a look at the Atari 2600. So this is a, a French model Atari. So this is, uh, will have a CCAM uh, video output. So there's basically two standards in the world now for video. There's PAL, which is at 50 hertz, and there's NTSC, which is at 60 hertz. And the, the hertz is the refresh rate of the TV. And that's even carried on into HD now. So those were the SD kind of frame rates, but in HD you'll find American source HD content is 30 or 60 frames. And UK and uh, some Asian region source content is 25 or 50 frames. So these, these standards still exist in the world. An outlier of that is CCAM. Uh, CCAM was used in France and still is to this day. Uh, it's very similar to PAL, but uses a different method of color encoding. And what that means is if you plug a CCAM signal into a PAL television, you get no color. It's in black and white. So Atari produced um, consoles for the French region, specific to France. And that's because there's legislation in French law that states that uh, if you have an AV device in, in France, it needs to have RGB output on it or it needs to be CCAM compatible. <laughs> so that created a load of interesting console variants uh, in, in France. So for instance, if you get a French Mega Drive or French Master System, they're already RGB enabled, unlike the versions you would get in the States or the UK, which would typically only have RF output or composite output if you were lucky. Uh, in France, they had glorious full resolution, full color RGB long before the rest of the world. But that comes later. What, what, we, what we're dealing with now is CCAM. So the CCAM Atari 2600 is kind of the poor cousin to the uh, uh, NTSC uh, Atari 2600. Uh, this one has a palette of 16 and can only display 16. So the color palette on the CCAM models is, is reduced and that creates a kind of weird effect that we'll see later on in the video. So what I'm going to do is just lift the lid on this guy and I've already taken out the pieces uh, already because I've already modded this. So in order to get a CCAM uh, console or any kind of CCAM device, you're going to need to modify it. Um, over here we can see this is the RF CAN and this is taking in uh, composite encoded CCAM video and it's uh, RF modulating it. So you, I could take composite encoded CCAM video off of this board, but again, that's no use to me because my television doesn't support CCAM and most people's TVs don't support CCAM anymore. And you're really only going to find a few TVs in France that still support the standard because it's kind of depreciated over time. Okay, so we're mainly concerned with this chip here. This is the TIA chip. That's the television interface adapter chip, uh, custom chip for, from Atari. Uh, and that's doing the video encoding. Um, so if you take a look at the Wikipedia article and I'll, I'll link it in the description and here's some pictures of it here. We can see the NTSC and PAL palettes uh, available. And then below that, you can see the C severely reduced CCAM palette. So uh, if we just do some quick maths, um, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight by 16, which I think is 256, let's just do. Eight times 16 is 128, sorry. So on uh, NTSC, you get 128 colors in on an Atari. Uh, on the UK, it, the PAL one, it looks like you get less. So let's just have a look. Uh, that's one, two, that's eight times one, two, three, 13. So eight times 13. 104 colors for PAL, uh, and then CCAM, you can see you're getting eight colors. So the CCAM games look a bit weird, and, and that's funny, we'll get to that. But, so in order to get RGB out of an Atari, it's actually pretty simple, because the TIA chip already has RGB on it. It's producing an RGB signal. Uh, it's taking it into um, all these discrete components, and basically is encoding it in this area. I think it's encoding it uh, into, um, a either NTSC PAL or CCAM signal and that happens here then it's RF modulated here and then what you do is you connect your TV um, that there, uh, there's a cable that comes off of this can and out of the back and that's where you connect your TV and then you'd have to tune your TV in to receive the signal 
we don't really do that anymore, do we? We just plug HDMI in, or if you, you know, in this instance, uh, SCART in, or or component cables, you just plug those into your TV and you just select the channel, AV1, whatever. So you don't really tune your TV in anymore. And that kind of makes all of this section redundant. We don't really need to use it. So what we're gonna do is take uh, the RGB and sync signals directly from the TIA chip and just put, pass them through a buffer and then some resistors and then connect that to a, you can see down here, a DIN cable. And that, that's it, that's all we really need to do. So if we flip the board over, you can have a look at the other side of it. I've got wires attached to the, t the back of the TIA chip and that's going into this little board here. Uh, and this circuit is designed by um, a guy called uh, Mr. Eddie or Monsieur Eddie uh, from his blog, which is linked below. And he's the one that's already done most of the work uh, required to sort of work out this mod. But in real simple terms, what we're doing is we're taking the RGB signals separately from the TIA chip. We're passing them into a buffer. So this is a uh, 7408 uh, logic chip. Uh, so this is what the internal of the 7408 looks like. It's a load of AND gates. And if you're not familiar with logic, basically AND gates uh, have to have two ones on the input to produce a one on the output. So in this circuit, we've connected the inputs together. Uh, so that means that both inputs are always the same. If it's a zero, the, the output's zero. If it's a one, the output's one. Uh, and that creates a buffer. So we're no longer reliant on the logic levels directly from the TIA. What we're doing is we're buffering them and then adding some resistors to um, give the right impedance to the video signal. If I connected the resistors directly to the TIA chip, I would be messing with the functions of the board. So we're taking the signals, buffering them, adding resistor values, which I think in this case are 220 ohm resistors. That, uh, that gives the right impedance to the video signal out. And then all we're doing is just connecting up a master system uh, SCART cable to the back of the back of the console. Uh, yeah, so if we have a look at the the, log, the diagram that, that Mr. Eddie made, um, this is a simplification of a diagram from someone else. It, I'm, I don't speak French directly, so I had to translate the page to see it. But it looks to me like someone designed a much more complicated circuit and then Eddie um, simplified it down massively. Uh, so that And that's the circuit we're using. And even any circuit could be simplified a little bit more because it's taking a 12 volt signal off of the board and using that as the sort of logic switching level for the SCART cable. Um, so if you don't know, um, there's a pin on the SCART cable that when it goes high, causes the, allows the TV to automatically switch to that device. So, you know, if you turned on your VCR, it would send five volts down the cable. The TV would go, ah, the VCR on AV2 is live. I'm going to automatically switch to that. Basically, that's what the five volt signal does. So he was taking the five volts and then knocking it down to two point, 12 volts and knocking it down to 2.5 with the Zena diode. You can see that in the, in, the, in the diagram. I don't really think I needed to do any of that, so I haven't. Um, so what we're taking is five volts and ground from the voltage regulator on the Atari voltage regulator. We're taking um, uh, RGB video and sync. So that's these four connections down here. One, two, three, four. And then we've got two wires here and that's the sound. And the sound is coming off of the two pins, but they're both wired together. So we've just taken two wires, connected that, and then are using the resistor values that were specified in the circuit diagram to produce the sound output. Everything is then wired onto this DIN connector and then we just plug into that. So what I've done is I've built the, built the circuit as per um, the circuit diagram of wired it up and of course I've tested it. Um, so we're pretty much done, our mod, our mod is done. Um, if you were to mod a, um, a uh, PAL or NTSC 2600 for RGB, it's exactly the same circuit. Um, you, you connect to the TIA chip pins of, and you, um, you know, I recommend buffering the output with, with a chip and the resistor values will be the same. And uh, you know, if you want to use a off-the-shelf cable, you can recommend the Master System you know, cable. It's pretty standard pin-out and wiring. Um, you put one of these connectors on the back, that's it. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much it for, for the Atari. What we're gonna do now is put it back together and hook it up to the TV. So then we can see that the differences in the color palette and how some of the games look a little bit weird. 
um, yeah that's the next step so after modding uh, modding the board we're gonna have to put the components back into the case um, and one of the one of the changes we're going to need is to make a hole for our den cable here uh, so I've I've drilled a hole in the back. This is a 16 mil hole and I've done that with a with a step bit. This is what a step bit looks like and on on my step bit it has uh, the millimeter numbers on it so I know you know 16 I drill down. The reason I picked 16 is um, if we measure the size of the DIN connector you can see here it's 14.58 it's essentially 15 milli millimeters. Um, so when we drill a 16 hole and um, you look it's got a little little cuff on it when we drill a 16 mil hole punk it goes straight in nice nice and flush with the case and then all we need to do is add two restraining screws to the left and right to hold that there permanently um, one of the things I'm thinking of doing is obviously this is this is wired now I've, I've wired it up for testing purposes I'm gonna have to create something to disconnect uh, between the um, the DIN cable and the board, and that's because I still want to be able to completely remove um, the board from the case. If I was to secure the DIN connector in, in position and wire to it, then it would be stuck in the case because these wires would be um, would be held there all the time, and I'd have to move things things around. So uh, with sort of adding disconnect to things in mind, I bought a load of um, these two pin uh, disconnects so you can see this guy here fits like this uh, so if this is on one end and this is on the other end then that's our disconnect I mean ideally I'd like a you know like a 9 or 10 pin disconnect but I've yet to source um, something suitable for that purpose so um, what we'll be using is these and I think what I'll do is just glue a bunch of them together so they all um, they're all next to each other like that, and then when they're disconnected, they will stay together. Um, but I've counted the wires; it's seven wires to the back of the plug. So I'm going to need uh, four of these with two wires each, and that's the next thing I'm going to do is solder these guys up, and then we'll uh, fit the DIN, DIN connector to the case, and and that'll be that'll be that for the case modification, and then we'll go and play some games. So before we wrap this up and put the whole thing back in its case, let's just have a look at the disconnect I put in. It took a little bit longer than I would have liked, really. It would have been quicker just to desolder the uh, back of the connector there and um, and just put the wires back on, really. But I am thinking, like, going forward, having disconnects in, in a mod just makes life so much easier. See, I can disconnect, remove the board, fiddle with it, come back, plug the board back in. I've marked on the connector uh, diagonal lines which indicate where the plugs actually go in because um, it's while it is possible to glue all the uh, all the female plugs together the male plugs aren't because they've got air gaps between them so if I glued them together I couldn't get them out again uh, thinking maybe putting some hot glue there and just like sticking that down uh, or maybe not maybe not actually let's just leave that the way it is uh, so uh, then we position the circuit board and again I don't really want to fix the circuit board to anything um, I think that's fine the way it is and then that just goes in there let's just move these wires and then there are some screws that go in that hold it in that position but yeah that's pretty much how the board sits in the case um, as you can see in the in the 2600, there's a ton of empty space in here. Like you know, you could fit illicit materials in there. We could fit a whole host of Raspberry Pis. Uh, could build a uh, Bitcoin farm. Whatever. You know, there's a lot of room. There's a lot of wasted space in here. And I think that's the design of it. You know, when when they did, when Atari designed this originally, they wanted something that would sit in your console and you know, in your TV console and look, and look, you know, like a piece of AV equipment. Um, and they achieved that look. Yeah, this is one of the woody ones as well with the fake wood grain on it, you know, particularly 
interesting to certain types. Uh, yeah, so all I've got to do is screw the top back on this thing and we're, and we're all done. We're ready to go. There's the connector on the back. A um, bit of hot glue to hold it in on the back and then two screws there. And, and that's it. Yeah, so that's the mod done. The 2600 is now fully reassembled. Um, so it's all plugged up. Connectors on the back. It's got RGB into the uh, TV here. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at some of the games and... Um, the color palette differences. So what I'll do is I'll put up some screenshots from a standard 2600 that are from uh, from the internet, and you can see the palette differences that we've got here. So uh, Dig Dug here um, has the eight colors that are available to it, or 16 colors that are available to it, even um, that's including black. Um, and it, yeah, it looks interesting. <laughs> this is a fun sort of color palette they've got I mean it doesn't detract from the gameplay I mean I think Dig Dug on the 2600 is a pretty good port of the game I mean the gameplay is is pretty much uh, exactly the same as the arcade uh, you know it's 2600 graphics so what do you expect ah, damn guy escaped me um, but it's a completely playable game, you know, it's absolutely fine. I think these, the Seacam palette is interesting as a kind of um, sort of weirdness to the whole situation. Um, yeah, so that's Dig Dug. Let's take, a, let's take a look at some other games. So the 2600, the NTSC version, had 128 colours. And it was actually capable of displaying all 128 colors on screen at one time. Line by line though, not pixel by pixel. So you could have one line. So the effect isn't particularly nice. I mean, if you look at a game, I think Yars Revenge is probably one of them that uses all of the colors or uses a higher palette of colors and sort of that, that um, barrier that's in the game. Um, makes a very bright and colorful screen. But if you're playing something like Junior Pac-Man here, you're going to need the maze to be all the same colour. Um, otherwise, it will just be confusing to the eye and it's too much to take in. So with the reduced Seacam palette, it doesn't really make that much difference. Um, it's less than ideal. Obviously, the ideal is to see the game as the, as the developers intended. Um, so let's take a look at a really interesting example of this. So this is, uh, this is Smurfs of the 2600. I think it was probably a French region-only game or it was you know, developed in France and then released elsewhere. So they would have developed this game for the Seacam 2600. They would have known the limitations of, of the 2600 and that's what they would have gone with. So it's really bizarre to me that they've chosen to um, have a green Smurf when they could have quite easily had a dark blue Smurf. The dark blue color is, in, is on the screen right there. That's the Smurf color. They could have had that. They could have had this sky blue here. They could have used that instead. But they, um, they went with green, um, which is... is bizarre so you've got i can't even play this game you've got a green smurf purple background it looks like purple trees maybe and then sort of yellow ish area and then i have no idea how i'm going to get over this thing and oh, that's rubbish so yeah this this game is a particularly weird example of how the seacam palette works and how it makes something look completely bizarre um i'm gonna have to just I've got to work out how to get over that hurdle. I mean, like, I can't die on the second screen. This is crazy. So the buttons do nothing. Oh, you seem to be able to do a super diagonal jump, jump which is intermittent at best oh what a shitty game yeah so this is centipede for the 2600 and the reduced color color palette makes it a slightly uglier game but it wasn't that pretty to start with so you know it doesn't really change anything um it's just as playable it's the, you have to think back as well when the 2600 was out people still had black and white tvs you know they weren't Colour was, was, for some people, still not quite something they had in their house. This is the 
late 70s, especially in the UK and Europe, you know, we weren't as well off as the Americans were. We didn't have as much disposable income to spend on things like this. So, you know, if someone had a 2600, they may very well have had a black and white TV and had no idea that all these colours were weird anyway. Yeah, so um, that was probably something that was taken into account when they made the decision to only have the reduced colour palette for CCAM. Because um, there seems to be no real reason for it. It would have just required a few more components in the design of the of the board in order to allow a full colour palette in, in CCAM. Um, so yeah, so interesting thing that. Let's take a look at uh, one more game and then I think, I think that'll be it. Okay, so this absolute eyesore uh, is Akari Warriors for the 2600. It is awful. You can see here um, what I was talking about, about the um, individual colors on a line. So if you can see in the sprite, um, he's made up of almost the entire color palette um, in a load of lines. Um, there would have been no special um, special coding for, for CCAM games. They would have probably used some kind of nearest neighbor sort of color allocation. So that's why um, this game looks awful. Um, Smurfs, you know, is it was a is a bigger mystery to me. I think they really could have sorted that one out. But um, Akari Warriors, this makes sense. The colors are just crap because there's no subtlety in the palette. We have to go with what we've given: red background, purple numbers, <laughs> multicolored strange heads. We're, we're stuck with these with these limitations in the C cam palette, and there's nothing we can do about it. What a weird looking game. I think that's meant to be a house, isn't it? Anyway, if you found this video useful or interesting, please like and subscribe to us. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter, 16 Bit Bench. Uh, we're producing new videos all the time, um, all about retro gaming stuff and gaming stuff in general. Um, so, yeah, thanks for dropping by, and hopefully, we'll see you next time. What a piece of shit! Off. Oh.